As Christians, we experience mountains and valleys. Moments where our passion for Christ burns like a fire. Where we can say, Bless the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise His holy name. Where praise, thanksgiving, and rejoicing flow freely. But there are also moments where our sorrows and laments dampen our joy. Where confusion and dark valleys can cause us to question and mourn. Where cries for salvation ring loudly. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. The highs and the lows. All of the emotions and experiences of the Christian walk summarized in one book. The Book of Psalms. It is so good to be with you this morning to open up God's Word and to hear what God is saying out of His Word. Um, that's why we're here. Anyway, it's so interesting to me as we open up Psalms 150 today um, to hear the songs that were selected, um, that, were, that were selected probably weeks, probably even months ago, and just to hear the kind of that 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 holy is the Lord kind of song is kind of being sung. So I'm 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 always encouraged when I hear the Lord's providence in the midst of this uh, in the church services, and I'm so excited about that. So again, we're going to be in Psalms 150. Um, it's a song. It's the last psalm of the Psalms, not the, not the last psalm of the series, the last one, and it's really talking. I think it it gives the punch to the end of Psalms in what they should be pointing towards. And it's pointing towards the Lord. It's talking about worship and lifting our voices up and our hearts up before the Lord in worship. You know, we are born with our worship gear turned on. Uh, There's never a time when we're not worshiping. And that's the scary part because we are giving ourselves to something or something all the time. It's a continual process And I believe the psalmist is talking about where do we direct our worship and how we need to continually direct our worship. One of the definitions I kind of pieced together this week was worship is giving our devotion to someone or something is worship or praise. It's that giving to. We are told in the psalm to praise the Lord because we want to give our praise to another. This is really him pointing, the psalmist pointing us to our current object of worship. Like it's pointing out where are you at in this and it's wanting to point us up to the Lord and we'll see this and throughout some of the scriptures that we read this morning. Um, And this worship sometimes we say is is just like songs we sing. And it's kind of sometimes reduced that we had a worship service, we sang some songs. Yes, we use that. Those are aids in those things, but that's not where my heart is or where we should be in worship. Idolatry is simply a misplaced worship. Many times we, we stop, we think of idolatry, we think of a Buddha statue, we think of other countries, we think of Eastern countries where you see that kind of worship displayed, but it's literally just misplaced worship. I heard someone say this, and it stuck with me uh, for a long time. I've probably heard it four or five, maybe even six years ago. He said, if, if you lose a good thing, you're sad. But if you, if you lose an idol, I'm devastated. Philippians 3, verse 2 and 3 says this, and Paul speaking to the Philippian church, said, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate, mutilate the flesh. So he's talking about, they're talking about the conflict of circumcision within the church and how to take earthly or fleshly things and put them in and saying these had to be done. So he's saying this to them, verse 3, he said, For you, we are the circumcision, that he's talking about the circumcision of the heart, who worship the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. This is talking about worship towards God and not relying on my gifts or my talents or my abilities or maybe even frozen by my past failures. Sometimes you don't think that's worship, but sometimes worship happens when I'm so consumed with what happened in the past I can't let go of today. 
I can't focus on the day. And I'm living in that if I could have done some, something different, if something would have happened, it would have been different, and today would be different. But you know, God knows those as well. It's putting no confidence in yourself. We, we see that Paul is wanting us to look towards who? Jesus. He's wanting us to look past that. He's worshiping by the Spirit, but we're worshiping Christ Jesus. Matthew 6, verses 19 and, 19, and down, down through, we'll hit a couple of scriptures from there, says this, and Jesus speaking, he says, Do not lay up treasure for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither, rust, neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. And he says at the end, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. My treasure is my worship. That's where my heart is. And this is what the psalmist is pointing towards, worship. Then he goes on in verse 21. It said, no one can serve two masters, for you'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And I'm not saying money. He uses that because it's, we use that for everything we have in life can buy things, he can do things for us, and I can't serve that. So the, the comment is you can either serve God and use money, or we serve money and attempt to use God in the process. He goes on in verse 25 and says, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat, drink, and wear. So he's talking about the very primal things of life, the very sustenance of life. Don't worry about that. He said, be, he said don't be anxious about that. Because anxiety really is a worship problem. Sin really is a worship problem because we're saying, who is my source? Who, who am I trusting? And it comes in many times when we hit a wall, we hit something that's in front of us, and all of a sudden I rise up because it's beyond me. I can't fix this right now. I need something beyond me to fix this, and so I'm looking for someone to trust the psalmist really wants us to look at this, and he's addressing this in the way about worship, but he says, let's look and see what the psalmist is saying in chapter 150 of Psalms. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I want to read this together, read it out loud. Well, you don't have to read it out loud. I'll read it out loud. Psalms 150 verse 1 said, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the trumpet sound and praise him with the lute and the harp, praise him with the tambourine and the dance, praise him with strings and with pipes, praise him with sounding cymbals and praise him with loud clashing cymbals, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, this morning as we dive into your word this morning, God, we are so grateful for the word that you've given us in this book. We're so grateful for the scriptures that allow us to illuminate our minds, that we get to understand who you are, and in that moment that we get to understand who we are, we are transformed. Faith is birthed. God, without your word, without knowing who you are, without revelation of who you are, we're people most pitied because we're left to our own devices. So God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for these people here this morning. Father, I pray that the words that we say, their ears that we hear, Father, you would bless them this morning. Would you be glorified in our time today? In Jesus' name, amen. So point number one is who do we praise? And it says it in the very beginning, he says, he gives us a clue here. It's not a clue, but it's, a, it's an answer. Praise the Lord. This is really speaking to the otherness of God. This is speaking, pointing directly to only God. He is worth our devotion. <laughs> he is this idea of worth-ship, something that is most worthy. We're talking about the word glory, which literally just means weight. And he is the most weighty object of worship or affection. And when we think about his excellent greatness, it's hard to put this in any other category because we label many times lesser things great or excellent, 
right? So we think of food and experiences and creation and people. We say these are awesome. And so when we want to describe God with some of these same words, it doesn't quite have the same punch. Like we want to say, is God as awesome as the burger I had last night? We say those things, right? And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm thinking like, let's put it in context with that one. When I climb a mountain, I begin to view over the valley. Is, is that awesome? I was, um, a group of us went out to Arizona about two years ago for a, a conference. And then after the conference, we went out to Sedona um, for a couple of days to hang out there. So if you've ever been to Sedona, it's pretty majestic in, in some ways. It's, it's pretty stunning. And when you begin to just drive into that area, it is when you see these mountain formations and you see them standing, just this little piece standing up there, and then there's nothing beside it. And then you look over and see these massive mountains over here and these just where there's sheer drop-offs. It's just the stone. It's just it's magnificent to look at. So right by two weeks or maybe three weeks before I went out there, I'd actually listened to a, uh, a documentary that Del Tackett had put together in, it was called the uh, Genesis, is Genesis History. It was really talking about scientifically looking at what's happened with the flood. And was this evolution or was this a, a catastrophic uh, moment or event that happened. And so they're going through different scientists and talking about this. So they're speaking exactly, they were speaking to this point in the kind of Grand Canyon, Sedona area where the, the rocks and the formations of those have actually, they can see they're brought in from two different directions. And so they're looking at mud they, or rocks that were brought from like, that can be put back into Mexico, like the same soil is brought from Mexico, some from Canada. So you're looking at in, in our context, there's literally rock formations being brought in from different areas and they're brought in from two different directions. So we're talking about, they're really making the point that this happened because of a flood. Something catastrophic happened. And so this moved, and so as I moved through this part, I'm going like, if this really was the flood happening, and I'm walking in the midst of this, I'm going like, I would be like maybe 300 feet underwater right now, and this mighty mammoth, powerful storm happened, and this all happened because man was evil all the time in the presence of God, and God chose to save Noah and his family out of this moment. It really made me feel extremely small. This immense power on display, it proclaims, God, you are awesome. You are excellent. You are great. This God is the object of our worship. When we look at the attributes of God, we see his altogether otherness. He, he's, there's no other way to describe them than the fact that he's not like us. He is spirit, which means he's not like humans and he's not constrained by any of the physical limitations that we have. He is sovereign in control of everything, life and death. He is holy, completely untouched by sin. He's omnipresent, which means that he's everywhere all the time, past, present, and future. Like sometimes I live in the past, but I can't do anything about it, right? And sometimes I live in the future, and there's nothing I can do about that now. Maybe we prepare a little bit for it, but I'm present. God is everywhere at the same time, and that just makes my mind go poof. He's omniscient because he knows everything from the macro to the micro, even the hairs of my head. He knows them. He's omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful. There's nothing that challenges his abilities. He's immutable. He's never changing. He's truthful, and it's impossible for him to lie. That's why when we lie, it's such an affront to God because it's not who he is. He's good. Like They're talking about the goodness of God. He's a good father. He protects and sets boundaries for his people. And when we study the scriptures, we see that he's majestic and righteous and gracious and merciful and faithful and just, trustworthy, upright, redeeming. He's in a category all by himself. There's no one like him. And we get this description of people who have seen him face to face in the Bible. So we look at people like Moses and Ezekiel and Isaiah and John who caught glimpses of him moments of him and were completely wrecked. John, as he faces the Lord 
in Revelation falls like a dead man. And Ezekiel, when he sees the Lord, falls on his face and needs the Spirit to lift him to his feet. Isaiah found himself being unworthy to stand in his presence. Literally said, I am an unclean person and I stand in the midst of unclean people. Like who can stand this holiness of God? He saw and like, I can't even speak words because they're so dirty in the presence of this holy God. Moses is physically glowing after seeing just a portion of God. In Revelation 5, we see this This vision again of John Revelation chapter 5 starting in verse 11 he said then I looked and I heard the throne I looked around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriad and myriad and thousands upon thousands saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and in earth and under the earth and in the sea and all them that were in that saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the four and the elders fell down and worshiped. This actually reminds me a bit of this picture we get in, in, in when Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's coming and the people swell in worship. This is the moment when they're being triumphantly entered and he is the king coming in. And of course, there's people trying to hush that because they're feeling there's going to be a rebellion because of the Roman rule at that time. And, he, and Jesus said to them, if they would be quiet, the very rocks would cry out. This is saying that there's some worship coming from the presence of God that can come no other way. And it's talking about the sea and the creatures within the sea and the land and the trees and the rocks would all cry out in worship to the Lord. He is worthy of our praise. I think this is what the psalmist is saying, to praise the Lord. He is the Lord and he is worthy of our praise. His very presence commands our praise. Point number two. Where do we praise the Lord? So praise the Lord, praise the Lord in his sanctuary, praise him in his, in his mighty heavens. Sanctuary is likely referring to the temple in Jerusalem where they would gather for worship, where sacrifices were made, where scripture was read, songs were being sung. This is a corporate call for worship, to gather together as God's people in one place and lift their voices in worship. The prime reason we gather, this is the prime reason we gather here on Sunday mornings, is do this. This is not primarily about me. It's not primarily about you. It's about lifting up our voices to the Lord. A.W. Tozer says this, that worship is the missing jewel in the church. We often miss worship, and the reason for this is that we make worship about us, my preferences, what I want. I want my felt needs met. Does, does, does the music sit right with me? Was it, is it my preference, and, and is the timing right? We forget that we've come before the Lord. We're we're called to gather. Where has the Lord called me to be and to gather and worship? And we cannot have profound corporate worship without an intimate personal worship. This is what we sometimes want to replace. Like I want Sunday morning to replace what should be happening even in our personal time of worship with the Lord. This practice of meditation has been hijacked by Eastern mysticism. Um, where they move to empty themselves in order to find inner peace, or they're looking to find this goodness found deep within, within themselves. But meditation is simply just setting my mind on the Lord, setting my mind on something beyond ourselves. This is having my mind renewed by the word of God, renewed by something bigger than myself. Romans 12.2 says this, don't be conformed, 
to this world. Don't be formed into it, but be transformed by the renewing of a mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and right. This renewal happens, this worship happens as we give ourselves in devotion to the Lord. This is ingesting the word of God. It's, it's being in prayer. This is transformational. Faith comes, we hear in Hebrews, right? Faith comes, transformation comes by hearing and hearing the words of the Lord. That's exactly what he's talking to do. Listen to who God is. Let that transform you. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says, we do not lose heart. That's us, Christians. Though the outer man is wasting away, right? We see that. The older we get, we see it's wasting away. And the inner, but the inner man, he said, is being renewed day by day. Now, he's implying here that we are being disciples who are in God's word, who are hearing this, and we're being renewed day by day. Like, this is going consistently. This is moving forward. This is a consistent dialogue with the Lord and fellow believers. This is submitting myself to the word of the Lord, but it's also submitting myself to other people and asking them to look into my life, see what's going on in my life. Is there things going on that need to be corrected? This is not showing up just for obligatory religious rituals, but it's this pressing into the Lord, pushing beyond my resistance, the spiritual resistance there is to being in prayer and to reading God's word and to worship. And A.W. Tozer again says this in the book Discipleship, that let the old saints be our example. They came to the word of God and meditated. They laid the Bible on old-fashioned handmade chairs and got down on old scrubbered board floors and meditated on the word. They waited and faith bounded. The spirit and faith illuminated. They only had Bibles with fine print, narrow margins, and poor paper. But they knew the Bible better than some of us with all the helps we have currently. When our personal worship is healthy, then we have something to contribute to the corporate body. That's what we need this morning. Like I, I need to be built up so I come and actually share something with everyone. And every one of you have the same process. When something's happening, when your current worship is happening personally, you bring this. Now all of a sudden there's this unison and, 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 and giving to one another. This happens in corporate services, but also in our small groups, in our communities. I need to have something personally so I can give to something at work. I need Monday morning, I need to be in the place where I'm giving something to my, the people around me, the people that I'm called to be around. Where we worship starts personally and moves corporately. Point number three, why do we praise the Lord? Praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. So this is this exclamation of his excellent grace, uh, greatness. It's a lifestyle of worship that doesn't just happen on Sunday mornings. And again, this is talking about meditation we talked about earlier. Like it's, it's, it's talking about being in this presence, like meditating on, on his excellent greatness. After Moses led the children of Israel out of, out, of the, uh, out of Egypt through the Red Sea, God instructed them to teach their children about all the things that God did. So if you have your Bibles, we don't have to do this, but we're going to be in Deuteronomy 6. It'd be a great time just to read this. Again, I'm going to read portions of this. And this is, again, right after he came out of the Red Sea. This is God's command to Moses. Now, this is the commandment and the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you would do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord. Here's the fear of the Lord coming again, that, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons. So it's generationally, we're supposed to be teaching our people the fear of the Lord. Then jumping down to verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Again, he's pointing up to who he is. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the command. Um, and these words that I've commanded you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. So it should be in your heart, and you should be able to teach them to your children. And when you talk of them, and when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, they should be as frontlets before your eyes. And you write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It should be everywhere. 
And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you this great cities that you did not build, and houses that you did not, and, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God. You shall fear him. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall have no other gods before me, gods of your people who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your, the, the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. He's telling him to remember to be able to say these things over and over again so that we would not forget who the Lord is. This idea of forgetting this means that, that we become very self-focused, very self-absorbed. I don't know about you, but I think I can do this very quickly. I can switch in minutes how quickly I can be self-absorbed and make it about myself. And he's telling him, I want you to know God. I want you to know him because if not, you're going to be self-absorbed. You're going to look at yourself. You're going to be complaining. This is the children of Israel all the time. If you read the story of them, left Egypt, God rescues them. They're praising God. And it, was, it seems like it's two minutes later, they are in grumbling mode. They're self-focused. Things aren't going right. Our knowledge of, the, of God causes us to be thankful, which is, again, pointing us back up. Colossians, if you go to Colossians 1, verses 9, I love this scripture. This scripture, if you want to pray something for yourself and for your family, for your church, for your neighborhood, this is a great thing to pray. I pray this over myself and over my family on a daily basis. I pray it over our church on a daily basis. This is what I want our church to be. So he said, verse 9, he said, so from, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you and asking that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him and bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And he goes, you see, this, you see the cyclical part? Being filled with the knowledge of his will, then being filled increasing in the knowledge of God. The reason for this, verse 11, is that you would be strengthened with all power. You, you see the power of looking at when I understand who God is, there's, there's a sense that there's a strength because I know that God, who God is, and he's promised to be with me. Strength, that you strengthen with all power according to his glorious might, not mine, for all endurance to push through and with patience to be able to wait with joy. Joy is because he's with me in the fight. And then verse 12 is the part I want to point towards. Giving thanks. He's telling us to point up. <laughs> You're getting all this stuff, but point this up. Don't stop. Point up. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance. There it is. There's our heritage in the saints of light. And he has delivered us from the power of darkness. This transfers in the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. This is literally saying that when we understand who he is, when we understand him in an increasing way, it allows me to view things, everything differently. I get to view it with a different lens, the good and the bad. Because I'm not viewing it in my sense of what I have to give, but I'm viewing it in the sense of who the Lord is. Psalms 95, 2 said, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord with songs of praise. Psalms 100, and verse 4 says, I will enter, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. It was a command. If you look through the, through, I mean, you can go through a list of them. If you, if you just do a little research on that, there's tons of things where God is saying, thanksgiving to the Lord. Give thanks to him. We give thanks for who he is, what he has already done, and what he's promised to continue to do for his people. The neglect of thanksgiving in our world is stark. There's just this lust for this immediate, my, my immediate needs being met. We're not grateful. And we're not thankful for what he has already done or what we already have. This is a worship problem. 
Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Don't be anxious about anything, but with everything in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So he's not saying don't ask God for things. He's saying, yes, do this, but don't be anxious in the midst of that. Like, put your proper perspective in here. Let your eyes go up. The Lord is lifting, lifting your eyes to the Lord in thanksgiving allows me to ask these things of the Lord, but I'm doing it because I trust him. Colossians 4, verse 2 said, continue steadfast in prayer and be watchful in it with thanksgiving. So again, he's asking, make these requests known, but do it with thanksgiving. The reason why thanksgiving is such an important element in worship and praise is that it keeps us from being angry and bitter and envious. Like just so many times I'm angry because I didn't get my way. Things didn't go the way I wanted. Something went sideways on that one there. Someone said something. Someone did something. And I didn't get what I have. And I begin to be this bitter person where I'm angry because it didn't work. And if I put my proper place, or if I view this in proper order, I begin to see that God is the one in control. And I get to trust him even when I don't like what's happening in front of me. It helps me from being self-focused. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 says, For it is all for your sake, so that grace extended more and more, pe- so that grace extended to more and more people, that it may increase thanksgiving to God. The things that are happening around you. It's done for a reason, but it's done so that we can give thanks and make much of the Lord. Ephesians 5, verse 4 said, Let there be no filthy or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. And I think even this, when we talk about filthy and foolish talk, we think about maybe it's just cursing. But I think many times when we're not grateful and when we're bitter, our mouth just runs a lot more than what it should. I'm just saying a lot more things than what I should. I, I let it run further. I, I, I let it go unchecked. Instead, he said, let there be thanksgiving. Let this be pointed upwards. The angels before the throne of God in Revelation 7, verse 12 said, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. This thanksgiving is part of something that will continually happen over and over again. Thanksgiving gives us this perspective beyond my current circumstances and points me upward. Point number four. How do we praise the Lord? Romans 12, 1, we read, we read verse 2 earlier, but this is Paul again appealing to the Roman church. said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It absolutely matters how we live our lives. We're reflecting someone. We're we're. We're representing someone way beyond us. We're representing some, so it matters how we live life. This is an everything type of worship. Psalms 111.1 says this, Praise the Lord, and I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Again, in Psalms 9, verse 1, it said, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all the wondrous deeds. Psalms 86.12 I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Psalms 119.10, with my whole heart I will seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. We talk about this whole heart part. I'm giving every part of it. I'm not holding anything back. Jesus then speaking to the woman um, at the well in John 4, 23 and 24 says this, the hour is coming and is now near when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what he's saying is you can't worship the Lord in spirit and truth if you're not born again. He's literally saying that there's a, the hour is coming, it's not here yet, but it's coming when this can happen. Uh, before this, this was just fleshly obedience. This was just any, a, 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 an atonement or something that was given as, a, as an offering before the Lord. But now he's saying this new creation has the potential for wholehearted worship before the Lord. 
And it's literally whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, as Ecclesiastes 9.10 would say. It's every part of me should be longing to be able to wholeheartedly worship the Father. And it's this disconnection between the reborn spirit and the truth of who God is is where this worship happens. I understand I'm born again. I've got the capacity of knowing him. I know about him and worship then is wholehearted. This is wholehearted worship. There should at least be this desire to worship or to grow in worship. How do we worship the Lord with everything we have, full devotion to the Lord? I think about this when I think about full devotion. I think about the disciples when Jesus called them. And he asked them, they're in the middle of work, and he's going like, I want you to follow me. And I'm thinking like, how would I respond to that? I'm in the middle of my job, and I'm thinking like, wait, wait, I got, I got, a, couple, I got a couple questions. Like, what, what's the health of the church like, right? Uh, did you have a 401K? Like, what's happening in the next? And Jesus said, no, follow me, and they just dropped it and left. Didn't say they had any conversations about that. I don't know what the conversation, I don't know what's going through that. I know what's going through my head. They left in full devotion and followed the Lord. They dropped everything. Being a living sacrifice means that we're doing everything in the attempt to honor the Lord. Everything should be done to honor the Lord. And this is what the psalmist is saying. In everything, give praise. The psalmist also goes on specifically to speak about praising God with musical instruments. In verses 3, 4, and 5. And there's a little part in the ESV commentary that put this. And I love what they said about this. Praise him with the music and the dance not only is the topic too great for mere human voices to do it justice, it also deserves a full expression of human energy and devotion with instruments as varied as trumpets and lutes and harps and strings and pipes and various cymbals. Sometimes our words fall short in properly articulating who God is in our expression of who God is. So sometimes instruments are used to aid and help us express worship to God. This is not an emotional manipulation. So sometimes we'll use the music the right time to say the right thing. This is not a musical manipulation, but is rather bringing clarity and helping to emphasize the expression of worship. Everything should point to and describe and glorify who God is. In Second Chronicles 5, verse 13, He says, it was the duty of the trumpeteers and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to God. So this was on purpose. They they had planned this. There was practice. They were on tune. They were in time. They knew what they were singing. They knew the parts of that one. It was was encouraged for that one there. And listen to what happened. So they heard themselves in unison praising in praise and thanksgiving to God. When the songs were raised and the trumpets and the cymbals and other musical instruments in praise the Lord, and this is what they said, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. He said that moment the house was filled with the Lord and was filled with the cloud. I think of this literally being in this, in this place where the rocks would cry out before the Lord. This worship was exuding from that one there and the, the worship leaders were in harmony, lifting up and making, cl- giving clarity again to the words that were being said. I think it is the job of worship leaders to use everything in their disposal to aid in the declaration of the Lord and who he is. Every part should be there. We should sing with excellence. We should read with excellence. We should come together with excellence to make much of him. When A.W. Tozer said that the jewel of the church was missing, it's not just saying that we think too highly of ourselves. We've lost the awe and wonder of who God is. This is the call of Psalms 150. He's commanding us and imploring us to place our affections on the Lord first, then all the other things that maybe we're longing for will be added to us. That's Jesus' words. There's no one like him, yet he so graciously made us a way to graft us in. Like me, I know me. How, how can I get over the wonder that he saw me and he chose me and he drew me? He 
He sent his son to live a completely righteous life. He paid the penalty for my sin and sent the Holy Spirit to regenerate mankind to live out for him. The job of the Holy Spirit is drawing us, leading us, pulling us. This magnificent God who needs nothing to complete him beckons us and woos us to himself for his glory and our good. This is why the psalmist would say at the end in verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That means us. That means the trees and the rocks and the, and, and the rivers and the rain and the thunderstorms. Let everything praise the Lord. So in a moment like this, I just want to ask, do you know him? Do you know this great God? Or is he just a figment of your imagination? He's just out there. Are you born again? And if you know him, maybe there's something that has taken this place in your life. Maybe there's a thing that you've declared is higher in affection than the Lord. Maybe God this morning is calling you to lay that down, to put it in its proper place. And the reason for that is not because he doesn't want you to have certain things, but he's jealous, God. He's jealous for his people. He wants your heart. He wants my heart. He doesn't want anything in the way. He loves his people. and He knows the same way we know what our children are. Go like, you've got to let that go because I want better for you. God wants better for you. He wants better for me. Let's pray. Father, this morning we are so grateful for your word. God, we thank you for Psalms 150. who gives us a description of being able to lift our eyes to you, to be thankful for what you have done and what you are doing and where you're moving and where you're shaping our lives. Chipping away at the old, making us new, new in our thinking, our minds being transformed by your word. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this psalm. Thank you for writing it for us that we can again turn our attention, our affection to you. May you be glorified in everything we say and do. We ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.